Welcome to our second breakout session here in the main room at Rackspace Solve LA. And here to talk about the future of technology is Rackspace Distinguished Architect, Adrian Otto. So you're all here to hear about the future of the cloud. But before I get into the future, I want to talk a little bit about the past. So I got some quotes for you. Back in 1943, Thomas Watson from IBM said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. He wasn't very good at predicting the future. Popular science back in 1949 was writing about the relentless march of science and its advancement. And they said that computers could possibly weigh less than 1.5 tons. Again, not too good at predicting the future. Back in 1981, Bill Gates said about 640K ought to be enough for anyone. So if these greats weren't so good at predicting the future, am I going to be any better? Well, I can't promise I will be, but I can promise that this will be entertaining. So the first idea I want to explore with you is about every company becoming a software company. We all need to use software in order to remain competitive. And more and more, we're writing our own software. So when you develop your own software, if you think about it from a traditional perspective where you plan it in advance, you budget it, you decide what you're going to do, you need to make some trade-offs. You're going to make a trade-off. Anyone made a trade-off between fast and cheap before? Or trade-off between good and cheap? Well, it turns out you don't have to make this trade-off anymore if you use modern software development techniques. Instead, you get something like this, where you're deciding between fast, fast, and fast. Because in order to make better quality, what you do is you release software in smaller iterations, and you gradually make your software quality better and better over time. You solve the financial problem because you're paying for the software in small increments over time. And so really, it's all about going fast. So in the future, I predict that people will use test-driven development and CI-CD in order to go fast. Now, if you develop software, chances are you're paying for testing. You're paying either your staff or somebody else to test that software prior to release. And then once you've released it, if you've got defects in it, you're paying again in order to deal with the things that you didn't find in test. Stop it. Just stop paying over and over again for testing. Instead, just pay for it one time and use modern software development paradigms in order to get there. Now, the trouble is, everybody knows CI-CD is a good thing. They would like to have it, but there's an Achilles heel. And that is, nobody actually has unit tests and functional tests for all of the software that they run. They just don't exist. So you can't do CI-CD. You can only do automated deployment and automated testing if you have tests that can be automated. If you haven't invested into those tests, you simply can't be successful with this strategy. So my prediction in the future, we'll invest more into software testing. So let's talk a little bit about the Internet of Things. A growing phenomenon. So devices are capturing data using sensors. So in my pocket, I have an iPhone. And this thing has a couple of sensors in it. It's got a microphone, of course, so I can talk. It's got a camera that can capture HD video. It's got a GPS, so it always knows where I am. It has a touch ID, so it knows who I am when I put my finger on it. It has a barometer, it has a gyroscope, it has an accelerometer, it has a proximity sensor, and it even can sense how much light is in the room and adjust the screen. Now, all these sensors are generating data. And this data is filling up our data, our data centers. So the amount of data that we generate is absolutely staggering. We measure it now in units of petabytes, where we used to measure it in gigabytes and terabytes. Now, to put things into perspective, a petabyte is a million gigabytes. 
for me, that's just a fascinating concept that we're now measuring data in millions of gigabytes as a unit. And when you use traditional data management strategies like a relational database, this model of fitting petabytes of data into that kind of a system doesn't make sense anymore. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because the data, the index of that data, will not fit into main memory on any machine that we can create. It just won't fit. So if you can't put the index in memory, you can't efficiently query it, you can't get any insight from your data. So what the big data systems do is they shred the data up, they put it on tons of machines, and they actually allow you to do a scan over the data set in its entirety, which happens more quickly. So this is what big data is all about. More sensors, more data, more problems. So enterprises are realizing that if they are able to collect and drive insight from this big data that they're able to collect, that they will have an essential competitive advantage. They know that they need a way to interact with their customers in a way that's in increasingly mobile, and that if they don't evolve, they will become disrupted. Which brings me to another cool quote. This was from earlier this year, TechCrunch, uh, in the opening of a, a fantastic article, they wrote this. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. And Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. So it's all about gaining insight. Now, who is going to generate all of that insight? So I'll ask this question. Where are all the engineers? Today, we have a shortage of computer scientists in the world. And we have a, an appetite for technology and advancement that's totally insatiable. About 200,000 students a year in the United States take the advanced placement calculus test. By comparison, about 14,000 students a year take the Advanced Placement Computer Science test. So that means about 7% of high school students that self-identify as good at math think they're also good at computer science. This is a hard problem to solve, and it will take decades for us to catch up. We are simply not producing enough computer scientists. They're just not learning it in school, and so they don't bring those skills into the workforce, and so there's just not enough of it in the job market at all. So I'm from LA. Chances are all of you are also from LA. And we all know a thing or two about traffic. Freeways are clogged with traffic. And I want to talk about something that's called the theory of latent capacity. This pertains to the elasticity of demand for a scarce resource. So the scarce resource is your freeways, your demand results in traffic. So the theory of latent capacity tells us that if we just made all of our freeways bigger, right, wider, put more lanes in every single, tra every single freeway, what would happen to our traffic? According to the theory, our desire to move will increase proportionally with our capacity to move which means that adding more lanes to the freeway for a little while helps. But after a while, when people realize they can actually travel and get somewhere in LA, then they make plans to do things that cause them to go somewhere in LA, and next thing you know, you're just as clogged as you were before. This same idea of latent capacity pertains to our desire to change things with technology, our desire to do more with technology. The more we can do, the more we will do, and then our ambitions keep going. So the good news is um, Rackspace is here to help. When you think about computer scientists, I told you there was a shortage. It turns out most computer scientists are busy running infrastructure, doing security management, doing configuration management, and they're not spending a lot of time adding business value. They're just running the show. They're doing operations. That's how most computer scientists today are employed. Now imagine what would happen 
if there were a way to free them up so that they could focus more on business value and less on the low-level plumbing of running their IT infrastructures. This is one way that we can deal with this shortage. Now, if I said, OK, as Rackspace, I'm going to take away all of this requirement for you to run infrastructure. I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to take care of this for you. Now, you've got this IT department that used to be running infrastructure. Do you just fire them all off? Hell no, because you need them, right? I already told you that the difference in this competitive world in the software economy is your ability to innovate and move more quickly than your competitors. That's about being able to use and make software that helps you do your business goals. So you're going to put those, that staff to task doing things that matter more to you. So this guy is Tim. He's got a network diagram on the board. And so let's talk about what's coming that's new and exciting in networks today. So like the cloud, networks have become programmable. We have a thing called a software-defined network. Software-defined network lets you create your own network on the fly, attach it to your application, and now your application can communicate securely with itself and its various components. And it turns out that this is available today in the Rackspace cloud as something we call cloud networks. You can create these uh, in a matter of seconds. But what I think is even more interesting than software-defined networks is something called network function virtualization. Now, NFV is just like cloud, except the thing that you're cloudifying is network capabilities. And this is interesting for, particularly for people who run large-scale networks. So tel telecommunication companies, for, for example. Let's say I'm a large telecommunications company. I have a big network of, a uh, big mobile network, and I'm currently 4G. And I want to go from 4G to the next G. Whatever the next G is, that's what I want to do. Which might mean I need to pull out potentially billions of dollars of capital that has been sunk and replace it with something else that can do my more innovative, newer thing. Well, no, 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 no. If we just had a programmable system that would allow us to treat network functions like software, it could be programmable, and I can continue to use the same assets that I've invested in over and over again to do more and more exciting things. So you'll see more NFV. So security. I heard laughing. Um, yeah. Look who's owned now. How many times in the last year or two have you needed to get a new credit card? Three, four? For me, I don't know. I've had at least three credit cards this year. And mainly they're because, not because somebody stole my credit card and started using it for nefarious purposes, but it was that there was a systemic breach of the systems that keep track of all my information. That's not going to get any better. In fact, because of the theory of latent capacity. And because of our ambitions to do more and more with technology and more and more with software, this problem's actually going to get worse before it gets better. So we're going to need to get better systemically at dealing with security issues. Now, the software we're running today is giant compared to the amount of software that we ran, say, five years ago, right? Five years ago, what did you have online? Your email, your, you had a website up, you might have been doing a little bit of e-commerce, but not nearly the amount of software that we have in our life today. And that trend is not changing. That's going to continue and continue and continue. We're going to have more and more and more. So it just so turns out that Rackspace has some stuff that can help with this uncertain world of dealing with your security. And you heard earlier, Boogie mentioned our security operations center as a place where you can trust Rackspace to take care of security, vulnerability, um, intrusion detection, dealing with cyber attacks, helping you with governance and compliance goals, helping you deal with what happens when you are breached, um, helping you with compliance with things like PCI and DSS. Uh, for a long time, we've been helping to mitigate denial of service attacks by using patented technology that we developed. We'll help you scan for vulnerabilities, and we offer database monitoring, encryption, and key management. And that's all available now. But I want to talk about science a little bit. This will probably throw you back to maybe seventh grade, where you learned about the properties of physical matter. And liquids, in particular, are my favorite, because 
first of all, they take the shape of their container. Secondly, they're an intermediate phase between uh, solid and gas. And the particles uh, have what are called intermolecular tr uh, attraction. So you have cohesion and adhesion that cause these things to kind of attach to each other and remain attached to each other even when they're in flight. It's the, the, pro the property of water that allows them to form into droplets. So software is just like a liquid. It takes the shape of its container. This happens because hardware has limits. So if your hardware is your limit, and you want to have bigger software, then maybe you just need bigger hardware in order to make your software bigger. Just make a bigger container for that software. And it turns out this works. You can actually make bigger hardware. In fact, Rackspace is doing exactly this. My colleague, Eric, Aaron Sullivan, another distinguished engineer at Rackspace, and his team, they developed a new server called a Barrel Eye. And this it was done not only just as a Rackspace effort, but as a community effort in collaboration with dozens of other companies. And we released all of this as an open design. So if you're so motivated, you can actually take the Barrel Eye design and use it to build your own server. Now, I think this is really funny because if you were to run top on this box, uh, if you look at some of the specs here, right, we've got up to a 4.1 gigahertz CPU, 200 gigabit, gigabit per second of memory bandwidth. We have something like um, 200 megabytes of cache on the CPU ship itself. And then the, th the CPU capability is up to 192 threads of CPU. So if you actually had a box with 192 CPU threads and you ran top on it, this is what it would look like. In fact, this is a box running one of these chips. Way down here at the bottom is where your process list starts. All of that stuff, that's all CPUs. <laughs> Two terabytes of memory and all these CPUs in a single box. So we've actually made a bigger container to allow your software to be bigger within the context of a single machine. But a single machine can only be so big. At some point, you need to fit your software on more than one machine. You want to tie together multiple machines. So hardware is one kind of container for the liquid of software. And there's another kind of container that's changing the future of computing, and that's the application container. So application containers are a way of building, shipping, and running applications. They allow a common method of combining application code along with the environment they need in order to run. Containers are, bar none, the most profound innovation since virtualization appeared commercially 12 years ago. There have been a lot of things that happened in the last 12 years. And I'm making the claim that this is as disruptive as any of those innovations. Imagine a world where compute is instantly available, not just in minutes, but in seconds. Today, the cloud is billed by the hour, and it takes several minutes to launch a VM, typically. Imagine a dream where that compute were instant. Imagine all the new ways that you could use that. That would be truly transformative. So today, we make that dream real. We recently announced Karina by Rackspace. This is a containers as a service, instantly available using native tools and APIs that allow a zero infrastructure worry. You're all familiar with O'Reilly Media. I am. I learned it, tons of things out of books with animals on the front, right? Well, let's hear about how O'Reilly has transformed their offering. I'm Andrew Odewan. I'm the CTO of O'Reilly Media, and we're makers of technical media, so we make books, famously the ones with the animals on the cover. We identified a problem, which is that people are learning new technologies in different ways than just a static book. Rather than just reading about it, people want to use it directly in the browser and have an experience with it immediately. Rackspace has been helping us with a lot of the back-end technology around Docker and around containers so that we can offer these environments in ways that people can easily access them. 
Carina by Rackspace gives us a way to offer containers really easily to the thousands of people who come to our website. And where we would really like to take the technology is to be able to support hundreds of thousands or millions of people to come who want to learn Spark, who want to learn programming, who want to learn any kind of technology. One of the things I most appreciate about Carina is that it's got great APIs. So that if we want to create a new uh, cluster, we can simply spin one up and have access to it within a minute. And that flexibility gives us great power to be able to do a lot of different things that we might not have even considered before. So what O'Reilly does is they've got this section of their website that has the, the interactive learning experience. And when you go there, there's sample code on the web. And when you, run that, when you want to run that sample code, you press a button on the website, and it launches a container through Carina on the Rackspace Cloud and allows you to run that sample code. And then in real time, you can edit that on the, on the website and change the sample code and instantly run it again. Now, that was never before possible without containers. Virtual machines wouldn't start quickly enough, wouldn't be cost effective, just wouldn't make sense to have this. So this is an example of a new possibility that is made real by using futuristic technology called containers. Now, this is available in beta today for free. All we ask is for your feedback. You can get it at getcarina.com. So containers are a little bit complicated to adopt. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to adopt container technology simply? And just before we launched Carina, our leaders asked me, they're like, Adrian, you say this is so much faster and so much easier. How much faster and how much easier is this than the old-fashioned way? And in answering that question, it got me to thinking. I made this remark that I thought my 10-year-old could probably do it. And that gave me an idea. So we recorded my son Jackson using Karina for the first time. And this is what we found out. My name is Jackson. I'm in fifth grade. I'm 10 years old. And I'm going to start a cluster named Foo. All right, let's do it. All right, there you go. <laughs> so Jackson's named the cluster, and he's waiting for it to build. This process takes about 45 seconds. Let's see what happens next. Okay. Oh, your cluster's up. OK. Well, now what are you going to do? I'm going to download the cluster. Download. Downloading your credentials, OK. And now you're going to your terminal, mm -hmm. all right? And you're going to do an LS to see what's there? I mean, no, wait. I, I typed an LA. Good, um, OK. You're going to CD into that directory? CD. You found the tab key. And maybe an LS in there to see what's there? OK. Oh, you have a docker.n file. You want to source that? OK. Source. Okay. All right. Now you're ready to run Docker Info. So, the cluster is up now. And what Jackson did is he downloaded his TLS security credentials. There's a zip file that's created each time you make a Karina cluster. You download that zip file, you run this script, and it sets up your local shell so that instead of creating containers locally on your own machine, they get created in the cloud instead. So now, do you want to run a container on that cluster? OK. All right. So you can run docker run space minus it busybox, all one word. You're running a container. Awesome. Now we're on top. Okay. All right. So Jackson brought up a container and 
He, well, he brought up a Carina cluster, and he ran a container on it in just a few seconds. And note that all the commands he's running here are using the native Docker client from this point forward in order to interact with the cluster. He's not using a Rackspace-specific tool. He's not using an OpenStack-specific tool. Uh, he's using just the native Docker tool chain that you would use to manage containers locally on your own machine, except everything he's doing is running in the cloud. Let's see what Jackson thought. Yes. There it is. You did it, Jackson. Very well done. High five. Yeah. So I think if Jackson can use Karina, that it's safe to say that any developer can use this. We have really made it that easy. But not only easy, but it's fast. It's bare metal fast. And not only do containers start in seconds, but they can actually just get more work done because they're not running in a virtualization, right? You're not paying that tax, that performance drawback of executing your containers within virtual machines. It's actually running directly on the host. And we've got a very uh, innovative way of isolating the security to make this possible. And if you'd like to read about this, it's on the Rackspace blog. I put a post uh, that explains exactly how that works. Now, I lead a software development project called OpenStack Magnum. And Magnum joined OpenStack earlier this year. And it's designed to combine the best of OpenStack for infrastructure software with the best of container software. Now, Magnum allows the creation of a new resource called a bay. And a bay allows you to run a container orchestration engine. Today, you can choose between Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, and now Apache Mesos. And this is great because it allows you to choose a native API experience. So if you choose to run Docker, you get the Docker API and use the Docker tools to interact with it. If you choose to run Kubernetes, you get the Kubernetes API, and you get to use kubectl in order to interact with it. And soon, we'll be providing the Magnum API. And that allows us to provide this not only on our public cloud like Karina runs in our beta today, but on private clouds as well. OpenStack also gives us the ability to choose to run our workloads on virtual machines if we want additional security isolation or on bare metal. So OpenStack Magnum is the instrument that allows us to provide this level of choice. So, available on public cloud today, available on private cloud tomorrow. And just as we simplified containers, we've simplified private cloud. Now, Rackspace private cloud is different than just about every other private cloud product that's on the market today, in that it is not a software distribution. It is a hosted service. You don't have a six months professional service contract required in order to get this up and running. Just as we solved complexity, we also solved reliability. And so from the insight that we gained as the largest OpenStack user in the world, we're able to provide a 99% or a four nines uptime guarantee with our private cloud product. So you get to decide, are you gonna run this in our cloud or in yours? So I argue that, in fact, the future is here today. So let's review. I talked about the software-defined economy and about going fast, fast, and fast. Those are your choices today. I talked about CICD, where you can employ the best practices of using test-driven development in order to free up time and money that you'll invest in your automated testing. The Internet of Things is filling the Internet with data that we're storing in big data, and that insights gained from that big data are your key to a competitive edge. I talked about software as a liquid, and that it takes the form of its container, and that you have the choice either to make the container bigger or to spread that software over lots of containers. And I talked about 
hardware as a container, and I talked about application containers as a way to scale out. We talked about the shortage of computer scientists and that that problem is not going away anytime soon. We talked about software-defined networks and NFV and that these will lead to profound efficiencies in mobile computing. We talked about security being a big challenge and that that's only going to get harder and that application containers are the next big thing and that you can get it today with Carina by Rackspace. You can also get it soon in the Rackspace private cloud. So that concludes my predictions of the future. Thank you all. I will take questions since we're technically a breakout session. So if you're curious about anything that I'm professing, um, I'll take the hot seat. Does Karina run on AWS today? No, it runs on OpenStack clouds today because it leverages Magnum, but it is technically possible to run it on other clouds, and that's something we'd like to do. We do have efforts that are underway to use containerization as a way to move from one cloud type to another. So if you did have a workload and you, you, you know, maybe you want to run it on Microsoft Cloud, maybe you want to run it on AWS, want to run it on Rackspace, want to run it on your own, that's a great instrument for portability. It's actually the best instrument for portability that we have seen so far. That's, that's the direction we're taking. Absolutely. So containerize your apps, and that container format it will be much more portable than any other option you have. Actually, it's containerize everything, microservices, apps, back end, everything to the Right on you. Yes. The application container? Sure, I can explain it. Um, I'm a super technical guy, so I'm always thinking on the super technical end of it. Um, and I would start talking about features of the operating system, like namespaces and C groups and the image format. Um, but for non technical folks, you can think of it like it's a way of packaging an application that's its software and everything the software needs in order to run. So if it needs system libraries, it needs anything installed along with it, any dependencies. All of that stuff gets packaged up as one unit so that it can be shipped together. And you can run multiple of these environments side by side on the same host at the same time, which is great because maybe your, um, your queue runs really, really well in an Ubuntu environment, but your application server is designed to run in a CentOS environment. And you want those things to run together with really low latency between them. And so you'd like them to be on the same host together, but you don't want to have to make a choice of like what, what operating system environment do I want my application to execute in? So containers are a great solution for that. Also, as the earlier question suggested, they're a way of having portability. So if I have a, a workload and I want to decide at deploy time whether to put this on a private cloud or a public cloud or another public cloud, it might be nice if I just had one way in order to get that done. Okay, and so containers make that possible for you. It's going to work in a deployed container as well. Exactly. exactly. No matter where he deploys it. Google Cloud Platform, Rackspace, DO, whatever. And the reason, the reason why, why this doesn't, doesn't work with virtualization, so you're, you're explaining the, the reason why it's portable. The, the reason why this doesn't work with virtualization is that you've got a virtual machine image, okay, and you're building everything from the hardware up into this virtual machine image. That means the thing is giant, it's usually many gigabytes. Nobody really wants to move around dozens of gigabytes in order to deploy an application, so we don't actually do that. What we actually do is we have really complicated configuration management systems that put layered software on top of some base system. You start with some golden image, you use your configuration management system to layer stuff on top of that. And what you end up with is a relatively complicated approach to getting your software to be an environment where it can run. And so one thing that, that you're talking about here is the assurance that what I run in test is the same thing that I run in production and I don't have any drift between those environments, right? As somebody who's done over 20 years of operations, I can tell you I've lost more sleep over one kind of problem than any other. 
and that's what we call environmental drift. And what that means is, what I tested worked in test. And when I put it into production, that thing did not work the same way. And the reason that happens so often is because my production environment doesn't match my test environment. Oh, why? Whenever why doesn't it match? Whenever you want to punch your developer, it's because he just said this. It works for me. <laughs> it, worked, it, worked, it, worked it worked in worked. dev. It's an ops problem now, right? And so a developer and an ops guy, as long as he has, I've said that yeah. hundreds yeah. of times and seen Mr. Hand become Mr. Fist. That's, that's right. <laughs> that, that, so so in container, you know, using container imaging, Docker did a great job of, of making this accessible and making this easy, of this concept of the container image where the environment is coming along with the application in a way that does not require me to bring the entire operating system with me everywhere I go. And it's fast. It is very fast. Exactly. You, saw, you saw that environment start up on a machine that had never run that OS before. It ran in two seconds or less. Had that been a boot of a virtual machine, I guarantee you it is impossible for that to happen in that time frame. It cannot be done that fast because we're not actually doing the starting up of the operating system. All we're doing is starting processes in an existing operating system using isolation features around that process. We're using those C groups and those namespaces in order to isolate the app. So did I answer your question yet? Yes. All right. Yeah, really compelling stuff. If you're a software developer, containers are the candy right now because it's solving real problems that you have every single day. So. Introduced to the containers and they're going crazy. They love it that much. Question here. Um, if I have an existing set of Docker containers, let's say in my Rackspace VM, so can I use Karina to manage them? If, if I'm, I'm running not... my, if I have existing containers in a VM, can I use Karina to run them? You can. When you run them, they're going to run on our infrastructure instead of in your VM. But if you have the container image or a Docker file for creating a container image, right? Once you build the image, you do what's called a Docker push, which pushes it either into Docker Hub or uh, a Docker private registry in Docker Hub. And then once they're there, when you run them in Karina, it's going to pull them off the Docker Hub in order to run that same container that you've set up to run in your, in your VM environment. So this is when we were talking before about multi-cloud, right? Where we're moving between clouds. This portab portability instrument is, is absolutely possible. So Karina today runs containers for me that I built and ran um, on standalone uh, environments that weren't cloud even to begin with. And now I'm running those things in cloud because I had them containerized. And, contain and Karina made that super easy for me. So how do I run this in my private cloud? Okay. On private on Rackspace cloud. Private uh, cloud. Uh, how do you run them on, on a private cloud? How do you run Karina really? on private cloud today? Um, well, you can't run it yet because we haven't added that in. But once we have the Magnum service available in Rackspace Private Cloud, you're going to be able to create this thing called a bay. Remember I said bays allow you to run um, orchestration software, container orchestration software? So the first one, the one that Karina does now, is Docker. In fact, a cluster of Docker hosts called a Docker Swarm. Next, we add support for Kubernetes, which is another orchestration, which is different, more opinionated, declarative system for running uh, a grouping of containers or microservices together in a thing called a pod. Okay, and then the final, the final option there is to run Apache Mesos, which is yet another way of doing, like if you have um, a very job-oriented system or you're doing lots of big data analysis, you might actually prefer um, uh, Mesos over the others. So once, once RPC has the ability to run a bay, you can decide what kinds of bays to run and start starting your containers within those uh, within those bays. So the process is start a bay. As soon as the bay is started, then you start the containers on them. With Karina, what Karina is actually doing is it's creating that entity, right? It's creating that thing that would be like your bay on your private cloud. Yeah. Any more? All right. That can go. Oh, there is. Okay. What's, What's beyond, beyond Docker? Yeah. More, More container okay. software. So, okay. so, so from a roadmap yeah. perspective, do you want me to answer that? Or do you want me to be visionary and look like more than two years down the road? Yes. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, yeah. 
anything I say here isn't going to be true. But I can tell you, based on, based on the, the trends that we see today, um, security and containers are going to need to fit nicely together, right? The cloud has produced a level of complexity that is unparalleled in our history. We're running more software now. We have more different environments. We've got more challenges than ever before. Containers allow us to take what we're doing today as like multi-tier applications and shatter them into dozens or hundreds of pieces in microservices designs. So our actual execution environments will get more complicated than they are today. We'll get more benefit, but there'll still also be more complexity. And with more complexity comes more challenge, particularly from the security perspective. So being able to do things like um, signing of images, verifying that every layer of the image is cryptographically um, verified, that we know exactly what's running within that, uh, within that layer. Uh, things like um, detection of, of escape from, from one into another. Things like um, being able to audit all that stuff. So um, I would predict that there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen around security and containers. That would be my guess. Better, better, better containers, containers, as far as, as, far as I, can I can see. see. Well, I'll come back next year and we'll make another prediction. How's that? You're welcome. Any more? All right. Well, I'm out of time, so I thank you all for your time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Adrian. Coming up next here in the main room, talking about the three technology questions every brand manager needs to ask will be Kristen Waldrop. That's coming up in just a few minutes at 410.